Warning! Watch this video only if you want to get useful hints, tips, suggestions, learn the menus, shooting modes, the app to transfer photos, and more for the Nikon P950. Do not operate heavy machinery while watching this video. Thank me so much. The Nikon P950. Technically, it's just considered a point-and-shoot camera, a bridge camera, but don't let that name fool you. There's actually a lot to this camera, and in this video, I'm going to show you what's under the hood. Whether you're a beginner or someone who's more experienced, you might pick up a thing or two or seven with this video. I'm going to show you some basic functions of the camera and some more advanced functions, so I encourage you to stick with this video and watch it through to the end. And by the way, most of the content in this video applies to the P1000 as well, since they are both very similar cameras. Oh, and I promise never to refer to the camera as the P950. Let's get started. That round button on top is your diopter adjustment. That should be the first thing you do when you get the camera. Just focus the viewfinder to your eye so everything looks nice and clear. The next thing you want to do is determine if you're going to be shooting in RAW and or JPEG. The fine and normal are JPEG settings as opposed to the more sophisticated RAW settings. You can also shoot in RAW and JPEG, but there's no compressed RAW. So your RAW files are going to be pretty large at 25 megabytes. And of course, as you know, you'll need something like Lightroom to decode these files. The next item you want to decide on is the aspect ratio or actual width and height of your images. If you're watching them on a widescreen TV, a 16 to 9 might be an option. If you upload a lot to social media, maybe 1 to 1 is an option for you for Instagram, but there's a lot to choose from. But since storage is cheap these days, might as well go for a large image size. Now this is a small sensor camera, so it's nice that you can actually make some adjustments to help make your image look a little better. You can increase the sharpening, the contrast, and the saturation. And here's an example without any adjustments. And here is just a little extra punch, which I think gives the image more pop. Now there are two ways to zoom with this camera. With this rocker switch in front, which is pressure sensitive, and with the menu, you can determine the zoom speed with the side zoom switch. Unlike the P1000, which has a dedicated focusing ring in the front, the 950 just has this small knurled focusing knob. The area near the front of the lens is simply a grip and you can try turning it all day and nothing will happen. Now let's take a look at some of the shooting modes for this camera. We'll start with the P mode or programmed auto mode. So it's like auto mode, just it gives you a little more control. And with the top dial, you can control the exposure by adjusting both the shutter speed and aperture simultaneously. The camera does the computation. Now you see the little star that lights up next to the P? That means that you are adjusting the camera's exposure value by turning that top dial. So as you can see, as the top dial moves, sometimes the star goes on and off. When it's off, that's actually the original value of shutter speed and aperture that the camera thought was best. Now there's another way to adjust exposure, and that's through exposure compensation, which is accessed on that rear wheel on the right. Some may find that's a little more intuitive way to change your exposure. And here's an example where you may need it, where you're in harsh sunlight and you wanna drop the exposure because the camera is fooled a little bit. And you can see with exposure down one, sometimes the camera gets fooled under certain conditions and you need this feature. Now in A mode or aperture priority auto mode, we are controlling the f-stop or the opening of the lens. And we do that with the rear wheel on the back by turning it. And you can see as we make the adjustments, the f-stop shows that it's changing. People typically use this mode to get good depth of field, but being it's a small sensor camera, you see even with the lens wide open, you really can't get a blurred background. It's very hard. And to make matters worse, as you can see, as you zoom up even a little, those aperture numbers get bigger very quickly, which means it's harder to get a good depth of field and it also lowers the light. So you need a lot of light to make things look good. But the best way to isolate your subject and get that dreamy background is by really extending that zoom and or getting close to your subject. And that'll really help your depth of field and make it look more like a full frame camera. The next mode is the S mode, which is shutter priority. Depending on what you're shooting, you may want to have control over the shutter speed. If you want to freeze the action of a fast moving object, you'll go for a very fast shutter speed, or this camera can go to a really slow shutter speed. Now, some shutter speeds are not available, as you can see in red. There are limitations depending on what ISO value you have the camera set. 
And also depending if the camera's at wide or telephoto, only certain shutter speeds are available. Now this mode is great for dialing in your exact shutter speed, but another option, and you do this outside of the shutter priority mode, is setting a minimum shutter speed. So this tells the camera that it can do some calculations, but it can't go slower than a particular shutter speed. So if you're doing street photography, or maybe you're photographing some fast moving animals, you wanna have that control. Now, if you decide to use this mode, what I did notice is that if you have your ISO set to a certain value, the minimum shutter option is grayed out. So you have to set the ISO for a range, and then it allows you uh, to set the minimum shutter speed properly. As an example here with my son jumping, 1 15th of a second, it's blurry. Even at 1 30th of a second, still blurry. You have to go faster than a thousandth of a second. So if you're doing any kind of sports or fast action photography, use shutter priority. Now going the other way to really slow shutter speeds, those inches are actually seconds, by the way. So past 30 seconds, you have something called time mode and bulb mode. And the way that works with time mode, picture starts when you press the shutter button the first time and ends when you press it the second time. But since you're limited to a 60 second exposure limit, you won't be able to get those dramatic star trails. And in bulb mode, you also have that 60 second limit. You press the shutter button and when you release it, the shutter closes. And do make sure you have a sturdy tripod for both of these modes. So while we're on the subject of shutter speed and ISO value, you can dial in an exact ISO number for the camera, which determines how bright your image will be and also how grainy it'll be. But better yet, you can determine a range and a maximum so the ISO will not go above a certain level. Now, there are compromises, though, you have to realize. So if you want to keep the image not grainy, you're going to sacrifice shutter speed. Look at this example here. If you set the ISO for 400, which is relatively low, you have a half a second shutter speed. Real hard to keep it sharp handheld. So what you may have to do is you may have to go to a higher ISO in order to make your shutter speed more reasonable to handhold it. Like at 1600, the shutter speed is 1 8th, 3200, 1 15th. Personally, I'd rather take my chance with some grain because if the image is blurry, there's really nothing you can do with it. There's always ways to take out noise from an image. And even at the maximum 6400, it doesn't look that bad. So for the ultimate in control, you go to full manual mode, but make sure you have manual exposure preview turned on in the menu so you could see the changes live as you're making them. So moving the top dial will change your shutter speed and that rear wheel controls the aperture. Now there is another mode on the top dial called U and that stands for user settings. So if you use certain settings a lot, you could save them and by going into that U mode, they'll automatically be there. For example, let's say you do high speed shooting and you set your ISO to 100 quite frequently. The best thing to do is to save that setting and save user settings. So then when you go into the U dial, your settings will be there. As you can see, the high speed is there and the ISO is there. For the next hint, when the camera's asleep, keep the play button pressed in. And after a couple of seconds, voila, the camera wakes up from sleep. When you're in auto mode, you're gonna see a certain menu when you press the menu button. When you're in the moon mode, you're gonna see a different menu. Whatever mode you're in on the top dial, you're gonna see a slightly different menu. Here's the menu in bird mode. Here's the menu in scene mode. So you're not going crazy if you think, what happened? Why is the menu different every time? And that makes sense because when you're in auto mode, you really want it to be point and shoot and you don't wanna be confused with all these menu options, for example. Now let's discuss the high speed shooting options for the camera. So normally you have it set to single, but it can also do high speed shooting. When you're in the high speed mode, keep your finger pressed on the shutter button and you'll get seven frames per second, but only up to 10 shots. For the low speed, only one frame a second, but you can shoot a lot more at 200 shots before it stops. Now, if you're using continuous shooting, you may find you have a lot of pictures to review in your playback menu. Normally, you cycle through one picture at a time when you hit playback, but the camera is smart. It recognizes that you have a group of pictures. When you hit OK, it will open up that group, and then you could cycle through the individual pictures in the group. You can erase the entire group 
of images if you want. This way you don't have to erase them one by one. It's a smart way of reviewing continuous footage, but you must have it set in the menu to sequence display key picture only. Otherwise you're gonna have tens or even hundreds of pictures to look back individually at. Okay, so there's a couple of other interesting options. Continuous 120 means that the camera will take not 120 pictures, 60 pictures at actually 120 frames per second, so extremely fast. Here is a sequence I took. I actually strung the images together and sped them up. You could barely see any movement because there's 120 in one second. The issue is look at the file sizes, 234 kilobytes. These are really small images with very reduced resolution, so not very practical. The continuous 60 frames per second produces a 1920 by 1080 larger image, and here you can see the images strung together. It almost gives a type of slow motion effect, but you get a much higher quality image, and this is more practical for higher speed shooting. Now, there's a very interesting mode called pre-shooting cache. Let's say you're doing birding and you want to take the picture only when the bird actually gets ready to fly and flaps its wings. But you don't know exactly when that's going to happen and you don't want to take hundreds of shots and waste it if it doesn't happen. So this mode solves the problem by taking shots in a buffer before you press the shutter button. The indication goes green when you have pressed the button, which means it started the process. At two minutes, there I go. I pressed the shutter button. It takes a few seconds for the camera to process the images. Now, when you play your images back, again, you have that sequence display option. So you hit the OK button and you can cycle through the pictures. Now, I want you to notice how pictures were taken before the two minute mark. So before I press the shutter button, pictures were taken and a few after the two minute mark as well. So this is a great shooting option when you're waiting for something specific to happen, but you're just not sure when it's going to happen. Go to pre-shooting cache. You're going to get slightly reduced resolution photos, but it lets you go back in time. Use exposure bracketing if you're in tough or mixed lighting conditions. This is especially helpful with smaller sensor cameras. Here's an example when you've got bright sunny skies and the foreground which could be blown out. The camera will take a few pictures and you can pick the one that you like the best. Are you ready to have some fun? The multiple exposure mode, first take one picture, then take a second picture, and the camera will combine them both. It's like double trouble. Now the other fun option I want to talk about is kind of gimmicky, but it does kind of work and it's hidden in the self timer menu. That looks like a toaster there, I thought. It's actually a smile timer. So it's supposed to detect when someone smiles and then take a picture. And I tried this out. I actually wanted to try and fool the camera and let's see how it works. Actually, not bad. It got most of the smiles, even though I tried to really act like a moron and put on stupid faces, it worked pretty well. If this video is putting a smile on your face, well then please hit like. Okay, let's continue. The camera's built-in flash is really convenient for not having to carry around a separate flash, but you need to know that you must manually raise the flash in order to use it. I do recommend in the flash menu to always set it to on for this reason, because if you don't, the flash may not fire if it doesn't think it's dark enough. And there are situations even outside where you may want to use the flash to fill in shadows. Now take a wild guess what the moon mode is designed to shoot. The moon, Margaret, the moon. And Margaret, you should also know that the camera sets up the self timer. So when you depress the shutter button, if you're taking photos, it won't shake the camera. The camera also sets the autofocus to infinity, and it also gives you the option to change the hue of the photo in case you want to make the moon a little more red just to bring out certain features. I don't particularly care for that, but there's a button to quickly zoom in to 1000 millimeters by pressing the OK button, and you can change that in the menu to 2000 if you'd like. 
The bird mode has the OK button preset to 500 millimeters for a quick zoom, and you can also change that as well. Since you are very likely to use burst and high speed shooting when shooting birds, there is an option in the menu to go from single to continuous. So both the bird and moon modes offer you these quick shortcuts for these specialized shooting situations. Another helpful feature on the camera is the snap back button. When you're zoomed in too tight, a quick press of this button will zoom you all the way back so you can find your subject again. And then by releasing the button, you go right back into the subject. Please see my video about the zoom on the camera. I go into a lot of features and tips. The button on top labeled FN is a function button and any number of features can be assigned to that button. If you don't change it, it's set to high speed shooting, but keep scrolling down and you'll see FN. There you can assign anything you want from white balance to ISO. Just scroll down and you'll see that. It's not that intuitive on how to change that function button. It took me a while to find it. In this section of the video, I'm going to talk about my experience with the SnapBridge app. Keep watching if you want to see a train wreck. Maybe in the comments section, you can give me some suggestions. I'm going to show you exactly my experience, step by step, what I did, what went wrong, and maybe that'll help you if you run into the same problems. So you can see everything you need to do. Make sure you have the SnapBridge app on your phone or tablet. Here I had the Coolpix P1000 gives you an option easily in the settings if you want to add another camera. You won't have to do this if you don't have any cameras preloaded. And there's an option for the P950. I hit that and it went into a searching mode. The camera's right next to it, so it should find it pretty quickly. And the camera itself was set to be paired, but uh, <clears throat> there was a lot of searching going on. And uh, well, you know, let's see how long this takes. And uh... okay, so eventually we see something that says P950. That's a good sign. Pair with camera and just click the legal agreements. And now we go through another connection screen connecting to camera. I just love circles. I think you're saying that you need a lot of patience to go through this, but okay, we all have patience, so that's great. So what happens next? Pairing failed. I followed everything on that screen. Bluetooth was enabled. Forget the device didn't work. Nothing worked. I tried it again and it didn't work, but I got another message. Camera not found. See online help. Okay. So I guess I should go for online help. Is that what it's saying? Spoiler alert. Nothing online helped me. So I decided to delete the app and reinstall it. And maybe that might work. So I reinstalled the app, went through the process again connecting to camera fingers were crossed and you can see what happens next oh i got another message select an accessory the only problem is there's nothing in that box to select now i googled this and it seems that other people also experience this issue so next thing is i decided to update my firmware and i'll go through at the end of this video how you do that but sometimes having the latest firmware does help fix strange problems so i did that so now I have version 1.3 from 1.2, went through the process again, found the P950, pair with camera, circle time, and let's see what happens this time. Do we have a new problem or do we have success? What's your guess, guys? You think this is gonna work out? Select an accessory, but nothing is in the box again. Okay, so I'm running out of options here, but I want this god darn thing to work. In the settings in the camera, you can reset the entire camera to default. So I did that and I also tried installing the app on an iPad as opposed to an iPhone. I've had that in other situations where sometimes the operating system in a tablet is a little different than in a phone. So I went through the same steps again on the iPad. I'm not going to go through it in real time. I'll just fast forward this up, went through searching, did the legal, connecting to camera. We have the circle. And let's see what happens this time. Camera not found. See online help. I got to go for help again. I really do need help after this. I'm running out of options. Okay. I just took the battery out of the camera this time. And then a few seconds later, reinserted it. It's like rebooting the camera. Tried the process again. Select an accessory. Oh, something appeared in the box this time. Why? I don't know. 
but it finally worked. I don't know if it was a fluke that it worked. I don't know if taking out the battery did it or if just something random happened. My experience was with Mac OS. Maybe on an Android it's better, but this is buggy software. But when it finally worked, you can use it to do certain functions with the camera. I found that like ISO and exposure did not work. You can zoom it and it will also take a photo with the shutter button. So that worked. There is no operation for video, however, only for photos and it's limited. So that's the remote shooting side. You could also use it to download photos onto your phone or tablet. In this case, my tablet, you see the image and you can choose to download the original size or a reduced size. I hope you don't have to jump through as many hoops as I did in order to get this to work, but I just wanted to show you my experience and how frustrating it was. Now, let me just show you how to update the firmware. Google Nikon P950 firmware, it'll come right up. It's a little tricky and not that intuitive as to where to put the file. So you will have to choose your operating system and then accept the license agreement. Make sure you're doing this direct from the Nikon site, not some shady site so you get a virus, okay? Hit download at that point, and then it'll probably be in your download folder. Move it to your desktop, which is usually most convenient. Then you're gonna wanna transfer it to your SD card, but not inside any folder, just leave it on its own where it says firmware. If you do that exactly right, when you go into the settings of the camera to update the firmware, it will see the file and it will prompt you to update to the new firmware. Hit yes, make sure your battery is fully charged. You don't want the camera shutting down and you should be okay. A couple of final thoughts. So if you're not gonna use that app, which is not such a bad idea, then just leave the Bluetooth off because it's gonna save some more battery life for you. Speaking of which, the batteries are pretty weak and I do recommend you getting a nice travel charger. You can find them on Amazon really cheap. Some of them even come with a couple extra batteries. You can charge the camera via the USB, but this is so much easier. I also wanna recommend this book by Alexander White called The Photographer's Guide to the Nikon Coolpix P950. I have no affiliation with him, but I can tell you that it's a very informative book and some of the information from this video is actually extracted from this book. It's really good uh, and I recommend it. You can get it on Amazon. Thanks very much for watching. Again, please check out my other tutorial videos on the Nikon P950 P1000. If something wasn't discussed in this video that you're interested in in this camera, it's probably in those other videos. Thanks very much. Please hit like and subscribe. I'll see you in the next video.